All right, we have another great session lined up uh, for the final one of today. Again, I believe it's a first where we've ever had N9 and all of the N9 flags here at SNA. So we're very excited to have these OpNav leaders with us today. And the topic is so timely, investing for the future. So I think it's going to be a very intense hour plus. I'm going to introduce uh, Vice Admiral Bill Merz, a DCNO for Warfare Systems, once again known as OpNav N9, goes back and forth. <laughs> and Bill will introduce our other panel members, at least those that we haven't already had on our agenda a couple of times, of course, Ron Boxall and Dave Kaufman. So Vice Admiral Merce is a native of San Diego, graduated from the Academy in 86, subsequently earned master's degrees from the Catholic University of America and the Naval War College. He served on the USS Haddo, engineer on the Boise, RADCON officer on the USS Proteus, commanded the deep sea vessel submarine NR-1, the USS Memphis, and submarine development squadron 12. Ashore, he conducted submarine design research in Carterock, worked in the Pentagon as a budget programmer, served as head of the Naval Reactors Line Locker and Chief of Staff for Commander Submarine Forces Atlantic. His flag assignments included Commander Task Force 77, Naval Mine and Anti-Submarine Warfare Command in San Diego, Commander Task Force 54 in Bahrain and 74 in Japan, and he was the director of N97 before his nomination last summer to N9 promoted last July, now responsible for the integration of manpower, training, sustainment, modernization, R&D, and procurement of all warfare systems. One personal note, I didn't really know Bill Merce before, so I asked Vice Admiral Retired Jay Donnelly for any interesting tidbits about him. Why did my mic just go off? <laughs> to share with our SNA audience. Jay told me that about 12 or so years ago, when Admiral Merce commanded the USS Memphis, they won the Battenberg Cup Award. Now, we all know that's a really big deal and fairly unusual for a submarine to be chosen. So I did a little Googling over the lunch hour today, and an SSN has only been selected three times since the award was established in 1906. Vice Admiral Donnelly's son was, the, I think, the suppo on board at the time, and to this day, he tells his dad that Bill Merce is the finest leader and naval officer he has ever worked for. So with that, welcome to SNA. Thank you all. Over to you. Uh, well, thank you, Admiral. You're making me blush up here. Um, that resume is getting longer and longer every time I do one of these. Uh, so good afternoon, uh, certainly welcome to this uh, late day panel uh, on preserving our naval advantage and investing in the future. Uh, as as uh, introduced, uh, I am uh, the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for Warfare Systems, OPNAV N9. I think it's the, the most dynamic code uh, in the Pentagon, um, and I hope we can ex explore how some of these investments we've been rallying around are going to help our agility uh, our flexibility, and above all else, our lethality. Uh, that's really what it comes down to in our business. So to my left is the exceedingly talented team of superstars that I have the pleasure to work with uh, every day in uh, not just identifying the warfighting gaps, but fundamentally figuring out an investment plan to close those warfighting gaps. Uh, they determine the what, the how much, and the when uh, for our investment plan. Uh, they're who we collectively refer to as the resource sponsors, if you haven't heard that term. Uh, we call them also the high nines. Uh, they typically are the senior uh, community representatives in the pe Pentagon for their, for their communities. And then when we're done with our work, we sit down with our counterparts, with our chief financial officer, Admiral Lesher, on the N8 side, and we all get in a pile and we uh, develop a responsible financial plan to get us where we need to go. Uh, certainly sounds easy, as I read it out of my little paragraph here. Uh, it's anything but for those that have uh, uh, done the sprint around the E-ring. Um, but we are, uh, we are blessed with tremendous leadership right now. Uh, we have some very clear guidance. Uh, we're very closely aligned, we think, with the SecDef's guidance uh, as we continue to improve on our competitive posture. 
the supporting Navy investment strategy that you're going to hear referred to moving forward, especially as we um, move closer and then we roll out our 19 strategy, is what we call the Navy the nation needs. Uh, it's the NNN strategy. Uh, so get used to hearing that, but it fundamentally addresses um, the balance of our three priorities, uh, which is first and foremost readiness. Uh, that is giving the team that's out there today what they need to fight and win uh, while maintaining uh, a strong training foundation and a strong work-life balance. Uh, number two is establishing an environment and providing the resources to move quickly on advanced capabilities as, be, as they become available. Uh, this is fundamental to taking advantage of our, our long-held modernization posture on how we keep our capital investments, which are typically around longer than any other services, 40-year um, ship life, so that thing is as relevant or more capable on, on day last as it was on, uh, on its first day. And then finally, increasing the capacity uh, to pace the increasing demand on your Navy around the globe for presence and posture. Uh, the foundation of our basic away game mentality, which has been in place since essentially the War of 1812. Uh, we think it's successful, and uh, we're certainly not looking to walk away from that strategy. So all three of those, readiness, capability, and capacity, uh, need to be harmonized. And they need to be balanced uh, for us to put out this credible warfighting uh, output. So uh, essentially, this makes it a multiplication process pro uh, problem that inextricably links all three together, X, Y, Z, X times Y times Z equals NNN, the Navy the nation needs. As such, uh, you drive any one of those variables to zero, extreme case, uh, the output is zero. Uh, so if you overinvest in force structure, which we typically have done over the last eight years, you tend to uh, uh, disadvantage the other two. So all three need attention. Uh, I will tell you, we've been out of balance. We're restoring that balance. Um, and uh, we'll see how it goes. But we don't have to wait for this. We don't have to wait for the growth. Uh, we have been taking steps that, that we can facilitate on our own. Last year, we focused heav heavily on the cross-domain approach and the strengths combined together of the different communities to generate an effect that we hadn't considered in the past. This year, instead of making that a discrete focus, we're mainstreaming it into every decision we make. So it's becoming a lifestyle. Uh, a way we're going to operate going forward and, uh, and no longer uh, broken out. Also in support of these cross-domain effects, we're investing heavily in netted effects, combining traditional capabilities to generate this nonlinear capability. Instead of just adding more to get a linear increase, we're trying to add more and pull them together in thoughtful ways to create a nonlinear output. Uh, we're establishing an environment that concentrates more on output metrics. Uh, we are typically an organization that focuses on input metrics. Did you properly fund that program? We're done. Let's move on to the next one. Um, did we actually fund that program to completion delivery to deliver an effect that we paid for and that we were anticipating? Uh, that's what we're moving for. We've kind of always done that uh, intuitively, but now we're actually bringing in a lot of industry standards, uh, big data analytics for review and comparative results. Uh, not every program falls into that category, but the ones that do, we can move through much more quickly to focus on the much stickier challenges that are more warfighting intuitive based. And we're moving faster, or at least we're trying to move faster. Uh, working with our partners in industry, uh, the acquisition community, and Capitol Hill to reform our processes, to remove the hurdles, remove lethargy, and improve the agility in moving out on capability improvements when they become available. So the elephant in the room, and then no public debate is complete without stating the obvious, that it is exceedingly difficult to move out on any of this without an enacted budget. And we are now well into the second quarter of FY18 without one. So we're looking at another year, another half year at least, where our sailors, marines, soldiers, airmen, guardsmen, and our industry partners are unnecessarily disadvantaged in the face of increasingly threatening adversaries as we return to an era of great power competition. So in concert with the themes of SNA, it's clear that the surface warfare community, perhaps our most worked and stressed community, will continue to be the center of these integration efforts across a multi-domain environment. So with that, let me introduce my panel. I'll provide them the opportunity to make some opening remarks, and then we'll open it up to questions. 
So first, in order, uh, I'm going to go from 94 down to 9I. Uh, Mr. Rick Quaid, who is the Deputy Director for OpNav N94, uh, Innovation Technology Testing and Evaluation under the Chief of Naval Research. So the Chief of Naval Research now is dual-hatted, uh, if you weren't aware of the restructuring we did uh, about a year and a half ago. He also leads, uh, on my behalf, N9's oversight of rapid prototyping, experimentation, and demonstration efforts. So when we can move out on technologies, it's really over to Rick's team to get it fielded as quickly as we can. Uh, next to Rick, we have Major General Dave Kaufman, call sign Stretch, a Marine Aviator and Director of Expeditionary Warfare Division, OPNAV 95. Uh, Stretch gave a great talk yesterday uh, on SNA for those that attended. Uh, he's in, in, uh, in his portfolio, he covers amphibious warfare, mine warfare, uh, Navy Special Warfare, and uh, ex Expeditionary Combat Forces. He's also the lead of the land element domain. And then we have uh, Rear Admiral Ron Boxel. Uh, he's kind of a big name in this SNA. He is our lead SWO in the Pentagon. Uh, he's getting a lot of press this, uh, this week. Uh, good press so far. See how that goes, Ron? <laughs> Yeah, but uh, he's also the director of surface warfare, no surprise, as OPNAV N96, and he's the lead for the surface domain. Uh, next to Ron, we have Rear Admiral John Tamman. He's our newest director, the new director of undersea warfare, OPNAV N97. Uh, John comes to us recently from group command of Group 9 out in Washington State, where he had uh, essentially command of all classes of, of uh, our submarine force. It's the only place in the world where we do that. And then, uh, then we have our aviator, Rear Admiral Scott Kahn, call sign Satan. He's the director of air warfare and the lead for the air domain for OPNAV N98. And then finally, we have Rear Admiral Jim Kilby, another surface warfare officer. Uh, Jim is the director for warfare Inter integration, OPNAV NI, and he is really responsible for pulling this whole thing together. So he takes the collective inputs from the directors, and then he takes the collective inputs from the cross-functional teams that the directors support. And he stitches that together into the Navy the nation needs and matches it to the requirements. And he's typically the point man this time of year to, to make the music. Uh, so if you look across this table, this team collectively has uh, about 200 years of active duty experience and over 20 years as a flag officer, general officer, and senior executive experience. So I could not imagine a better team to be on this panel. So for opening remarks, we'll start with Rick. Um, as Admiral said, I'm Rick Quaid. Um, I work for Rear Admiral David Hong as the deputy for N94. Um, we're a little bit different than your traditional resource sponsor. Um, we kind of, we, we, we fund what we call the critical enabling accounts. So we have the S&T accounts, the T&E accounts, and, and targets. So from where we sit in the world, we kind of see the front end of the acquisition, RDT &E. We also see the back end when we actually go to operational tests and things like that. Um, you know, we're not platform, we're domain centric. We look across all domains, all platforms. We look for opportunities to reuse across those. So um, I know this is all about the surface warfare, but when we look at things, we look at the technologies, we look at the applicability of those technologies, how we can best use them in the Navy. Uh, we also provide a different perspective. You know, we, we provide a perspective of what is possible, and we also look for innovative designs, innovative solutions. Um, we try to, sometimes we have a pull for technology, but sometimes we're actually pushing technology back into the high nine. Um, I'm gonna, I think I have a few minutes. I'm going to talk about a few of the things that we are, we are doing to position ourselves for the future Navy. This is primarily process focused because we want to change the outcome. You got to change the input and the process we follow. So one of the initiatives we did this past year was we took a look at our S&T investment accounts. And we want to take a look at that and, and to determine how we could get technology faster to the fleet. Um, our, we want to do that. We want to improve the success rate of the technology that we transitioned. And we also want to strengthen our linkage back into the other resource sponsors and our other stakeholders. Um, interestingly, a year ago, we just came over to N9. We used to be in N8. So I think over the past year, uh, we've been able to leverage our, I'll say, our new organization um, and have conversations with the high nines in terms of what is it you truly need and how does that align with what we're doing. And so we're in the process of taking a look at that to make sure that what we're actually uh, developing and what we're transitioning is what the warfighter needs. Um, we have increased the alignment and integration also with RDA and RDT&E, &E, um, which what I won't say here today is go into every partnership we have, but everything we need, we do or are trying to do, there's a partnership with somebody. Um, if we talk later on, we'll talk a little bit about rapid prototyping. Uh, in that case, we've got to have a partnership with RDA and DAS and RDT&E &E to make sure that we have the policies and processes in place that allow us to go fast. 
Um, so we'll continue to have to work with everybody to make this happen. It's not a, not a single kind of entity effort. Um, the other thing we're looking hard at is test and evaluation. So we're the resource sponsor for the teeny ranges and labs and targets. Um, and what we've been doing is looking at uh, what is the future state look like? Um, specifically, how do we test systems of systems of weapons uh, in an operationally realistic environment? Um, today, testing is, is rather complex and, and to some extent rather expensive. In the future, we see this trend continuing as both the threat and our systems under development continue to evolve. Today, we typically uh, conduct most of our expensive and most complex tests at open air ranges, and we typically do that at the back end of our test programs so when you have you know, less margin for you know, schedule, less margin for cost overruns and things like that, so it's a high pressure situation. What we did is we looked out and said, what can we do, how can we do this differently? Uh, how do we go faster? How do we learn earlier? Uh, we did a, I don't call it an assessment, but after we looked at that, we've come to the conclusion and, and are moving out, and we're moving to what we call an ms based approach to T&E. So the idea there, partnering with system engineering and s and to figure out how do we actually build models, build environments, build automated test tools and things like that to actually bring testing closer, farther to the left and learn earlier and to get a better opportunity to actually make fixes when it's less expensive, when you actually have more time. Um, to do that, we are making investments in modeling simulation tools and we're also trying to establish what we call as a live virtual construct uh, for RDT&E. Um, and it's a construct, it's scalable, it's reusable, uh, it's something that will will tap into our warfare centers and the idea being, uh, think about it like in terms of like an iPad, uh, the idea being you can go into this iPad, you can pick and choose what you need to use to go do your testing. Early on you may do a component at a threat level but in the end you may want to do a high-end complex test where you have multiple blue, multiple red and other things like that. Um, anybody who's done testing, you know that's very expensive. It takes a significant amount of time and effort to actually coordinate it, and then you hope that everything goes right, and when you have all these airplanes, ships, and ranges, and targets, and things in the air. So we're moving to that. Um, it's going to be difficult. It's new. There's a lot of uh, culture challenges. Uh, you know, we have not done this in a lot of instances. We have some examples of where we, we're getting better at it, um, but we don't, it's, it's, it's something we have to bring not just ourselves into it and, and convince ourselves it's the right thing to do. We have to convince the programs and POs. And in some cases, we have to convince OSD that this is going to be good enough to do adequate testing. Um, but we will move there. We are moving there. Um, we may not be going as fast as we'd like, but uh, that's, that's where we're headed. Um, and we're going to continue to lay the groundwork to make that happen. Uh, the final area I want to discuss real quick was our rapid prototyping and accelerated acquisition. Our goal was to develop flexible funding sources that allows us to actually go and do and meet emergent requirements without having to go palm for it. Um, you know, if somebody came in today and had an emergent requirement, you know, in theory, we would have to put that in a POM and we would wait, have to wait until we get a budget. So we have existing authorities. Um, there are pots of funding. And what we're trying to do is actually figure out how, what's the best way to leverage them to allow us to go faster. Um, that's a, uh, working with Daz and RDT &E and others, we're trying to figure out not just how do, we, how do we actually get the money freed up to go faster, but how do we put the right policies and processes in place that allows the acquisition side to go faster as well. So again, there's a lot of new things there we have to go figure out. Um, I believe we have the authorities. Um, I believe we have the right people in place to go do this. Uh, we've, we're seeing some signs of it. We have some programs now that are actually tapping in and using those authorities. Uh, we have a ways to go, but I think that's the future. So for, from N94 perspective, you know, we're looking at our investment accounts, making sure they're fully aligned with warfighting capabilities, making sure we're actually pushing through the system things that the warfighter needs. We're looking at new ways to do t and &E, primarily from an m and based approach to kind of pull everything to the left in terms of um, learning and going faster. And then we're trying to figure out new ways to actually free up some 6-4, what we call 6-4 pro prototyping money that actually allows us to actually meet emergent requirements quickly um, with some flexibility such that, again, we don't have to wait through the whole budget process, wait for a CRA, whatever it may be, to actually go and, and resolve some of our issues. So um, that's all I have. Uh, again, like I said, N94 is a little bit different than the other high nines. Uh, we're here, in, in a sense, to ensure that we're pushing through the system the things that they need and making sure on the back end we actually have the capabilities to fully test out their systems. Well, thanks. I'm going to uh, <clears throat> shock Jim Kilby and the boss. I'm going to yield back some of my introductory time. You can start your clock down there, Jim. Because, as uh, Admiral mentioned, we had such a tremendous opportunity yesterday uh, to stand side by side with the uh, surface director here and to be sandwiched between the uh, uh, slow boss and CNO. So thank you for the positive feedback yesterday, today. 
for our developing themes and narratives, and we seek your continued support to help us do the best we can for this critical part of the Navy the nation uh, needs. So what I prepped is I'm gonna do just a two minute drill to restate kind of our central thesis or theme or problem statement. And I wanted to spend maybe one or two minutes on kind of the literal or land domain and uh, our view of how the domains merge in our battle space that we focus on. And then I'll just uh, close with kind of a menu of intersection points that I think we'll get to depending on where the audience wants to, and the boss want to take the discussion uh, where we uh, intersect across the other, the rest of the team here. So, uh, so as I said yesterday, if you come to the well deck or the front office of N95, we are working on next generation expeditionary warfare because we believe we're at a transformational period that's gonna require us to do things different in the future than we have done in the past in order to prevail and win in current and future conflicts. Our problem statement, again, is war fighting from the sea tonight, if it happens, on out to 2070 and beyond in complex so-called anti-axis air denial or contested environments against hybrid or peer threats into the urban literals where everybody lives. As General Boudreaux said today, except for in Waterworld, everybody lives in land and, and it's not in the movies. <laughs> so this is where we are. Here's two big oceans and we must go over there to affect, we believe, in, in some form to affect their behavior. When we do that, we're clearly gonna be working across domains in this five domain contested environment uh, that we're talking about. Uh, increasingly globally, as the chairman and others are championing across combatant commander boundaries, geographic and functional. And then I've spent a lot of time the last few years in my warfighting work, uh, operational exercises and, and other ways, thinking about timing and phasing and risks, because I would suggest to you that when the U.S. perfects something, it's a good time to throw it away, and we've just about perfected phases, and that ain't gonna work for us. So across phases with disparate command and control relationships, authorities, and ROE, including gray zone warfare short of open conflict, and finally in chaotic so-called irregular warfare environments, asymmetric threats, conventional irregular operations, kinetic, non-kinetic dimensions, et cetera. So what we're working on in our thesis, working thesis, is that we seek to reinvigorate naval maneuver warfare, linking sea control and power projection in order to win current and future fights. So back to my uh, times at school, we can think about, and I thought uh, Representative Gallagher had a great speech today that kind of hinted at this, the whale versus the elephant, and we are the whale today. And we have potential elephants that we will have to take care of. Uh, and we will do that in a partnership for the Navy's, or the Navy Marine contribution of sea control and power projection. Uh, so when I wrote my paper there, I judged that sea control was necessary but not sufficient to get to victory in the war. Uh, and I will stand by that thesis. Uh, so we have to figure out, as I discussed yesterday at greater length, how to make those things work such that we can get where we need to go and then project the power of the nation based on our senior leaders' decisions. And our part of that is represented by, uh, by the team here. And I think importantly, back to the gray zone or this range of military operations, we think aligning to emerging national strategy in the discussion, a lot of emphasis on influence and how the U.S. influences other actors. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of fruit there, I believe, in the portfolio that I look at that can do that and can do it in a cost-efficient manner. So a word on domain. Uh, last year, as Admiral Mers mentioned, we did a domain approach. I was not here, I inherited that, but I looked at that work. There was a lot of good fruit there in terms of a way to think about the problem. What I didn't like was it's not really the land domain, and we're working on this. The land domain belongs to the Army, uh, uh, I would say by law, practically, or by rule, uh, and we can't compete with that. So we have to figure out how to merge with that. So in another panel, we'll be doing the panel at the joint level to broker it across the, func the functional components and the enduring functional components that most of the GCCs are moving to. So I'm working hard on trying to define this. I would welcome your help for all the influencers and thinkers out there. I don't like that word literal or littoral either. I can't quite figure it out. <laughs> we're trying. But it's not quite land. I think where the boss has got us and where we're thinking is close as far as influencing. But if you think about it, where, where the water meets the sea is where you can't get away with, with, with shortfalls in any domain because they're all represented. So the traditional Navy strengths of sea and undersea and contribution to air, and then, oh, now I've got another problem. I'm up against this shore, and it's got power or something I have to influence. So we're wrestling with that. We'd welcome your help on it. Uh, we think that somewhere at about the 200-foot mark, 
We get in business with the things that we sponsor and buy, and then we take them across the beach. We hand off control at some point there with the Marine Corps and other players, and then we go to some distance inland, and that's the space we're kind of thinking about. Here's what I'd leave you with about that to, to digest or write on or think about. <clears throat> CIFMIC owning land as part of its battle space. Uh, and then the Marine Corps, and I mentioned this yesterday, and the Commandant has, has sent us on this mission clearly. The question of the day in the Marine Corps is how does a MEF, our largest MAGTAF, fight under a CIFMIC as part of the naval component? Because frankly, we've spent the last 15 years fighting under the CFLIC in sustained land campaigns. We are back to sea. We need your help to figure out how to do that effectively and be part of the naval campaign. And where those domains cross, for my part, in that literal or expeditionary battle space, as we move from that and they all kind of come together, that's what we're working on. Next generation expeditionary warfare to apply the tools of the Navy, the Naval Services of the Joint Force as the leading edge to influence and potentially, if directed, dominate uh, that part of the landscape. So. so the points that I'll leave for the discussion or entries, and we'll see which ones of mine we get to. Uh, for our Amphib shop, we covered pretty well in detail yesterday. It's right here. It's part of the surface fleet. Uh, and then I tried to sneak in there. There are other backup elements of that, of our beach group enablers that come in play as we get further on range of military operations that are a challenge to us. Great overlap in the aviation enterprise, and we talked at some length here at the conference about exploiting the capability of naval aviation. Just forget whether it says Marines or Navy on the side, what does it matter? Airplanes or things that fly, manned or unmanned, that can influence action and get stuff done. That's a, that, I wouldn't even call that a scene because we wholly are vested in that. Uh, and those Marines work for Satan inside uh, naval aviation in terms of sponsorship. And I hope you'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, for MCM, again, not a big deep subject for this week, but we're all over the place, cross domain by rule, and a lot of exciting things there across, again, aviation surface other assets, and then particularly in 9-7 with our undersea work, UUVs, et cetera. Uh, and then NSW, also very deep in the undersea domain based on how they do business, and NSW, Admiral Szymanski and his team's efforts to return to the naval campaign. So sea, uh, undersea, uh, and then ac again across that, uh, across that scene. I'll leave it with that, and I look forward to joining the discussion in terms of how we contribute to the Navy the nation needs in that part of the space where all those domains come together. Thanks. So on the first day, God created ships. And then there were submarines. <laughs> and then, then there were aircraft. <laughs> but there were Marines with us pretty much from the from outset, the get -go. right? From the get-go, yeah. In the rigging. Right. Yep. So, you know, it's interesting that here we are this many years later, and I still worry about, you know, God creating ships on that first day. And, you know, so part of my brain, this side, I think, is about, you know, the resource sponsor role I have. I mean, whether I like it or not, we've got program managers out there managing programs or things that go on ships and keep our ships, our sailors, maintain, modernize, weapon systems, combat systems, all at sea every day. And that's incredibly important. Uh, and then I have this side of the brain, which I think is worried about uh, what it is those ships need to do. And when you think about what those ships need to do, it becomes not about just ships. It's about everybody. It's about ships, submarines, marines, aircraft, the networks we live in, the cyberspace, the tools we have to get to make us a more synergized, effective force. So uh, having been in the 8 organization for a long time, my first job was working in N8F, which was the predecessor to N8I, working for guys like Jim McCarthy and uh, Admiral Kilkline and Admiral McCullough and Admiral Klingon. Uh, and then spending some time with Admiral Blake in N8 and watching all this happen. And it's a very, been a very stovepipe thing. So when we moved to this high nines model, the nine, where we moved out and we focused us on war fighting, uh, and we remodeled the N9I to go after uh, more of an integration uh, look at things, how are we going to fight better with all of us getting together? Somebody who wakes up every day thinking about that. Um, we have struggled with that a little bit, but I think we're starting to get there. We started last year a little bit by giving us those domain functions that Admiral Mertz talked about. He talked about uh, each one of us kind of had a different view. So I didn't wake up and in the what used to be an SPP process or my program proposals going through as a, as a build to the budget for all the things I think I need. I was tasked with going to say, hey, go tell me 
how we get better at surface warfare, whether you're using ships, submarines, aircraft, uh, networks, go. And we went off and we did some work. And when we did that, uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun because it reminded me a lot about being a strike group commander and the John C. Stennis strike group a couple years ago. When the boss told us, hey, you got a mission to go do, no one ever came to me and said, well, the planes are going to do this, the ships are going to do this, and the networks might do this, and EW is going to contribute here. It was a, hey, what do we have to do as best as we can with all the things we have to go do that and prioritize accordingly? Never once did anyone come and say, this has to be with ships or this has to be. And so to me, that was a refreshing way to kind of look at the problem. Uh, and so we did, and we came up with some recommendations that I think transcended any one particular platform or uh, a domain specialty. Uh, and by the way, I meant to tell you, thank you for, for calming down today. Uh, <laughs> you were awesome yesterday, but more, you scared me a little. More coffee. I saw more the coffee. coffee. I was a little more worried. Coffee. Yeah. Anyway. It's not coffee. No, it was all, yeah. It's a monster drink or something. I don't know what you had going on yesterday. It was good, though. Uh, anyway, but so, so drove me now to this job, and I, I feel very strongly, as I think every one of us do up here, that we all know we have to get better. We feel that sense of urgency to to get better. So there's kind of a near-term problem. How do we take the things we already have and work better together? That's more how we fight, more of uh, the John Wades of the world at Schmidtick and out at uh, Fallon and our, getting our warfare uh, development centers together to figure out how we're going to fight better that way and don't just do it by yourself and they're all getting together and that helps us dramatically understand what we value. Uh, but then we have kind of inside the building not just what we have today, how we're going to get better and those programs of record and how we expand them or shrink them on, based on how they contribute, but programming for the long term. How do we get better uh, as a force across you know, surface, subsurface, aviation, and uh, networks, et cetera? And so I talked a little bit about that yesterday. A lot of it is about you know, commonality. Can we work together? Can our systems work together? How do we uh, design these things to work in a way that uh, makes us all better uh, for whatever we put into that network? Uh, I can't help but notice uh, in my own career, for those of you who saw yesterday, I talked about the old Spruance class destroyers, but there is a time where, where ships did everything kind of inside the lifelines. You, know, you were tasked with going and finding a submarine, and you did that, or you were tasked with going and protecting an asset, or, or delivering something, or doing a naval surface fire, uh, but those were individual missions, kind of ship focused, and you were assigned them, and you did them, and that was kind of it. But as our range of, of our weapons have gotten longer, as our sensors, as we've intercommunicated, our networks and our, our ability to connect, uh, that problem in your head starts exploding. Everything becomes, you know, I know you did a math problem earlier. I stayed with you. I got to why. I, I, you had me at why. Um, but, but that problem gets a lot harder. And so we have to think about designing those systems and, and you know, how do, what is it in, on ships, my left side of my brain, those things that are the platforms that we have out there, whether it's a ship or an unmanned uh, uh, surface vessel, that contribute to the larger force in all domains. That's the problem I'm trying to solve. And that's the problem Jim Kilby's gonna to talk to you about and how we value those things. How do we collectively value the importance of those things? So I'm now moving my thinking from just how do I make ships more effective to how do I make all of us more effective with those things that are on the surface. So I have to think about from the ships, I don't own a lot of stuff on my ships anymore because we do affect such long ranges. I have. I have unmanned air vehicles. I have things that I can launch underneath the surface of the water. I have networks. I have electronic warfare systems, offensive, defensive, and, and I own the platform. So how do we reconcile uh, how I get better with those things if we don't have a wider corporate view of how those systems are all coming together? So uh, that's kind of my overview of uh, how I look at it from my, from my vantage point. And uh, over to you, John. Thanks, Ron. First and foremost, I'd like to uh, thank the Surface Navy Associ or Association for providing the opportunity to speak today, and I think more importantly, uh, providing this forum where uh, all the high nines, all the resource sponsors can kind of show you that, uh, you know, the days of uh, uh, parochialism, I think, are gone. Uh, I think, uh, you know, having, you know, uh, again, I've only been here two weeks, but it's, uh, it's my, my, my fourth time now in, in, in 97 or 87 or 77. I think what's really changed over the four years is kind of the culture of the building, you know, kind of set by the CNO, where it really is all about uh, cross-domain uh, and, and building the Navy the nation needs. And I'll echo what Ron just said as a strike group commander. You know, I, uh, 
spent some time at Stratcom as, as a planner, and I'll tell you in the planner world, you don't plan one platform to go do something. You plan it for cross-domain, multi-region type engagement. So I think Ron was spot on and, 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 and acknowledged that. Again, I've been in, the, in, in, the, in the, the role of Director of Undersea Warfare for about two weeks. Uh, again, my fourth Doing time. Well the job, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> Hope you say that in a year. <laughs> or after the next Palm Cycle. However, Fair. my primary role is the uh, resource sponsor is to plan, program, and budget for the acquisition, manning, maintenance, operational readiness, and modernization of submarine force and support facilities. Additionally, and more importantly, uh, than my role as resource sponsor. I'm also uh, the lead advocate for the undersea domain. And the undersea domain is not just limited to submarines. When we talk about the undersea domain, we are talking about all things that deliver effects within or from the undersea. While submarines play a large role in the undersea domain, they are not the only platforms making significant contributions. Surface ships, maritime patrol aircraft, helicopters, and unmanned systems of all types are part of this undersea systems of systems. And anyone who's participated in theater anti-submarine warfare is familiar with that coalition. This domain approach helps remove barriers between all the resource sponsors so we can conduct war fighting and risk assessments of current and future acquisition programs to better integrate platforms, <coughs> payloads, and sensors in support of the undersea, undersea domain and undersea warfare at large. This approach also allows the Navy to ensure we are investing in the right capabilities as our potential adversaries continue to advance and evolve their own capabilities, making things more challenging. But how does N97 communicate its priorities for the undersea domain to ensure we maintain our, our current advantage? In 2011, we established a document called the Integrated Undersea Future Investment Strategy, what we call IUFIS. It's a living document that's been updated three or four times over the last six years. This IUFS establishes priorities and provides guidance for undersea investments in support of our key pillars, which are platforms, payloads, modernization, and people. In doing so, the IUFS prioritizes uh, the information exchange between undersea stakeholders and the fleets, the headquarters staffs, the naval research enterprise, and industry. The enduring challenge is to invest properly for a future undersea environment that will most uh, likely be manned, unmanned platforms, both operating independently and in a netted environment and that the, uh, the interaction uh, is complex, network, cross-domain, and uh, of capabilities and sensors as I previously discussed. Uh, the next initiative that uh, N97 has going forward is the Tactical Submarine Evolution Plan, or the TSEP. Uh, this TSEP captures the integrated development of submarine programs and serves as a tool to track and implement multiple parallel efforts. The TSEP is our tool to balance development and evolution of existing platforms and systems next generation new start efforts, and unmanned vehicles. It also serves as the entry point for vetting current and emergency, emerging technologies and capabilities for efficient, time-phased integration. This syn synchronization is essential to ensure we do not invest our sparse resources ahead of need, but at the same time, it ensures the uh, capabilities developed with a sense of urgency to support the warfighter. And under TSEP, there are four four main efforts. The first is to uh, uh, shorten the design and build timelines. The second is to coordinate applicable results from uh, future studies, both completed and those in progress. Uh, third is to align the missions with the uh, anticipated future while also grading our homework on previous efforts to see which of the uh, capabilities we want to continue into the future. And finally, we rigorously and formally identify technology gaps and driving technology solutions similar to our Submarine Warfare Federated Tactical Systems, what we call SWIFT, this model, which introduces new hardware and software upgrades to the submarine combat control system every two years. And what I would add that, you know, SWIFT, this is kind of our, our secret sauce of the submarine force because it ensures that regardless of the platform age, every one of our submarines has a modern combat system when they go to sea. And uh, I could go on for quite some time talking about what the submarine force does, but I do want to uh, fall in line with uh, my compatriot in N95 and kind of cut this short a little bit so that you guys have plenty of time to ask the, uh, the questions that are on your minds. So again, thank you for your, uh, your attention today. 
All right, I'm uh, Scott Kahn, the uh, Director of Air Warfare. Um, been here six weeks, so I'm still getting my arms around the beast. In terms of those that may not be familiar, familiar with N98, you know, planning, programming, budgeting, resources, uh, anything that flies in the Navy, both manned and unmanned. Um, any weapon you want to put on any of those platforms is in the portfolio. Aircraft carriers are in the portfolio. And those professionals who operate, maintain, and, extent, and sustain that equipment is in the portfolio. Now, our recent completed tours at Carrier Strike Group 4, uh, and that was East Coast out of Norfolk, trains and makes certification recommendations for all carrier strike groups, amphibious ready groups, independent deployers, agents ashore, making those certification recommendations to Admiral Davidson of Fleet Forces. Prior to that, I was the uh, commander at Naval Aviation Warfighting Development Center, working with John Wade and Jim, Jim Kilby uh, a few years ago um, out in Fallon, Nevada. And both those tours and that experience I gained in them has put a lens by which I view the future towards the high-end fight. Now, I'm not going to sit here in my opening comments and talk about the aviation portfolio and what we're doing. But I am going to talk, you know, we've heard the word domains used here. I'm going to talk to one domain that is often overlooked and take it for granted, and I'll call it the sixth domain. And it's the one domain that is our asymmetric advantage no matter what tribe you're from. And that's the human domain, our people. First and foremost, in combat for a high-end fight, we're not going to rise to the level of our technology or the capabilities of our opponent or, quite frankly, expectations of our seniors. We're going to fall back to our level of training. Training at the individual unit and integrated levels is focused on the high-end fight from Strike Group 4, Fallon, and I know Strike Group 15 on the West Coast. And I had a mentor of mine who defined the high-end fight near peer competitor where ordinance is going two ways, from us and at us. And from an aviation perspective for the last 20 years, I can say, by and large, ordinance has gone one way, from us to the enemy. That's going to change in the high-end fight. So the focus must be relaying in light of, of the technological advances on that human domain. And the technology that industry is giving us is delivering greater integration, greater interoperability. And I would say it's also creating conditions for an interdependency between aviators, submariners, surface warfare officers, Marines, you name it. And I look at that and I say, everyone's going to have to be good in that interdependent relationship. So as I look at training and certification and the lens by which I resource or will resource an N98, I think there's four key attributes. One, you need a training and environment that's realistic. It represents the real world as best you can. It's reliable. It's stable. Relevant. It's relevant to the equipment that you have today for a fight tonight environment or what you to deploy with, not what you're going to have five years from now. And then it's recordable. I'll get to that a little bit later. Then you need to have a syllabi, whether at the individual unit or integrated level, that has defined performance criteria that can be measured. And then you have instructors, the folks that John Wade is, is producing and Jim Kilby before him, or the folks out of the Aviation Warfighting Development Center, Groton, and new, the uh, Cyber Warfighting Development Center. All those things are creating instructors to teach the syllabi to those standards in that environment. And then the truth data. What the heck just happened on that training event? Similar to, you know, for football fans out there, how important is game tape to that team? Both to look at the team's performance and individual positions, whether a lineman, a quarterback, on the defense, linebackers. It's that type of truth data. What happened? Now, LVC was mentioned earlier. Uh, not only it's being integrated into um, the, what did you say, the, uh, how we're designing testing to reduce costs and capability, but we're also doing it in our, in our training. And a lot, what it's allowing us to do is see things in training before we see them in combat. Allows us to see failure in training so we don't fail in combat. And Jesse, I'll, I'll, I'll use your words, it's with a small f. I don't break things and I don't hurt people. And then it replicates threats digitally that we cannot replicate live. That falls into C in training before combat. And that allows you to repeat events really quickly to develop those proficiency from individual level operators to operational commanders. Now why are we doing this? 
because we can or because we should? I would argue it's because we should. Training environments are compressed in some cases in time, which is a choice, but you can always want more time to train. Eventually, you're going to have to deploy. And we're also compressed in the real estate of our ranges. We're running out of range physically to train to the full kill chains that we have out there. Additionally, we're limited in our access control spectrum. Some of it because of the FAA and FCC, some of it because of OPSEC. All those things are driving why we need to go to a different training model. And again, what LVC allows, and it's going on to now, and we are at the end of the beginning, I think, in terms of what we're doing out in the fleet, or what they're doing out in the fleet right now, is because we're training individual level operators up to the operational commanders at the same time, we're seeing gains in performance. How many musicians out there? Right? You know, whether it's guitar and you start by learning chords or piano by learning scales, uh, the bottom line is we got to start playing Beethoven sooner. And that's one of the things that LVC, I think, is going to deliver. But most importantly, the, no matter what training and capability we have, the foundation of that pyramid is the being brilliant at the basics. And aviation lexicon, it's got to be able to aviate, navigate, and communicate. If you can't do that, I can't use you. Finally, my experience in my two previous assignments is a firm belief that from young minds come fresh ideas. And if I can take those young, trained, disciplined warriors and put them in the right environment with the right equipment, they're going to deliver solutions that men and women over 40 won't think of. That's what we owe them. That's what we owe the future war fighters and the next generation that may be in college or high school right now. Now, do not read my comments that training is a solution to all our challenges. It is not. We will take a balanced approach that prioritizes readiness, capability, both new and continued investments, whether manned system, unmanned systems, networks, payloads, whether kinetic or non-kinetic, planning and decision aids to execute some of these complex tactics, and perhaps with some um, human machine teaming and artificial intelligence, and as well as the capacity. The readiness, capability, and capacity to fight and win the high-end fight. That's what it's all about. That's what we have to deliver. And with that, uh, I look forward to your questions. And Jim, over to you. Hey, uh, uh, thanks, Tate. Can you hear me out there? All right. Uh, well, 9i, the eyes for integration. And just to show you how integrated I've become, I was converted yesterday afternoon by Stretch, so my call sign for him now is the preacher. So uh, I hope you'll join me in spreading that love to him uh, from now on. Um, in all seriousness... Yeah, see how we do in the bomb cycle. <laughs> yes, we will. Integrated warfare is uh, charged with integrating the warfighting requirements across all the high nines. I couldn't be more pleased to be in this job and working with the folks I'm working with, so it's really, really a pleasure. But the whole point here is to tell a, a cogent story, which is the Navy the nation needs, as Admiral Mers indicated in his opening comments. So I want to tell you a little bit about what we do in N9I, because even though Ron gave a great introduction, there are some things. Uh, some gar animals there you probably wouldn't expect to be there. So first, uh, we're all about restoring readiness and wholeness, and that's the foundation of what we're doing and have done a great job in 19 and are working towards that. That's why uh, those accounts were moved to the high nines and we're laser focused on keeping that where it needs to be. The next run is capability, and that's how you have an effect greater than your adversary in addition to the training and the people that bring that to bear. So that's next rung for us is to be focused on that capability and for me, frankly, to advocate it across all the high nines. I view myself as non-denominational. I need to understand how that works and be transparent with the high nines when we advocate for that in an integrated program. And finally, capacity. And we talked about that, but uh, capacity is a capability uh, in and of itself. So that's an important piece of that holistic program approach. Um, in order to do this right, you have to have a community that knows what they're doing. So last year, we st stood up a requirements uh, course to make the requirements uh, resource sponsors a community, an RM community, just like the FM community. Uh, we've developed a course uh, that 
first teach will happen on the 22nd of January. And the idea here is to build uh, a bunch of RMs who have a skill set to work in concert with program managers to deliver, deliver a consistent product. So this is my third spin in NotNav. And uh, the first two were in N96. And I had great program managers, but they were different. And uh, they did different things. And we want to provide these RMs with the skill set and the metrics and the playbook to go attack that problem consistently and work with the program manager to deliver a program that's whole and, uh, and, and, and meets fruition of what we needed to do. So that's an important effort right now focused on military, but uh, we will include civilians. And there's a continuing education piece of this in the future. So this will grow. It's not pens down on 22 January. I think that's step one for us to get it right, and, and I owe that to Admiral Murs to deliver that product. Okay, so in addition to having a trained community, uh, I'm the JCIDS guy for OPNAV. And I, I, I go to the JCBs and my staff goes to the FCBs, so we represent the joint requirements part of the house. Uh, we also are responsible to Admiral Murs to be uh, the administrator of the process of the RQB, Resources Requirements Review Board. And we're developing that process too, so there's some uh, folks that are resistant to that, but uh, they need to get on board the train because we want those briefs to be actionable, impactful, and really tell a complete story, not just from a program side of the house, but what is that going to do for a war fighting capability. Finally, uh, we have normal acquisition process, which many of you are, are familiar with, and we have accelerated acquisition, which is a new focus area for us in the Pentagon. Rick Quaid talked about it. Um, I, I'm the manager of that process, work with DAS and RDT&E, and so some questions we ask or things that may be familiar to you is an urgent requirement comes from either the fleet, think about a UAN, or from the joint community, COCOM, GEON, or JUON, how do we handle that? And then we look at our own programs, and we don't just limit ourselves to that, but can we accelerate this capability? Can we accelerate this capability? And then the next very important question is, should we? Should we accelerate this capability? And then how do we accelerate this capability? So we have a process now with some rigor and discipline, and uh, it's, it's really gaining some traction and momentum. So we're working hard on that and trying to get the authorities and waivers in place to do things quicker, or as I say in the Pentagon often, faster or funnier. All right, so finally, um, uh, there's a piece that Admiral uh, Boxall and Stretch talked about yesterday, the preacher, excuse me, which is a, fle a future fleet architecture. And I think that's a super important effort for us to undertake. It's, it's, uh, it's almost uh, gargantuan to really get it. And I've talked to a bunch of people on why this hasn't been done before. I haven't got a good answer yet. But the idea here is to align programs across the high nines through relationships and have a system that endures these relationships so we can look three to 15 years out with some predictability and align studies and analysis and weapons across all our platforms to bring the most capable capability to bear. And I am on that task. And I'm working with all the people to my right to make this happen. So I'm a super excited about that, uh, more on that in the future, but Ron gave you a glimpse of that in the future but it's not just limited to platforms. It's limited to capabilities and weapons and the syner synergy between all those things. So I'm really excited to, about that effort. And finally, uh, as I said, we are agnostic. We are warfare pin agnostic. When I showed up to NINI, they gave me a business card with a SWO pin, and I said, strike that from the record. Uh, I am a warf naval warfare advocate, and my staff is. We look forward to your questions, uh, and Admiral Murs, I yield the floor back to you, but uh, again, super enthusiastic to be part of this group and delivering capability for our Navy. Thank you. So you can kind of feel the passion up here. Um, you know, half my day job is working with them, and half my day job is trying to keep up with them. Uh, a lot going on, a uh, lot going on across the Pentagon and the Navy. Um, I'll, uh, I'll get to the questions here. Uh, I would like to recognize a 
uh, during the question period, we also have our reservist here, uh, Rear Admiral Russ Allen. Russ, if you could just raise your hand there. Uh, Russ will eventually someday come to us full time, but right now he's dual hatted. Uh, the reserve community is, is equally as stressed as the active duty community, and, and right now Russ is essentially holding down three jobs as the Deputy Third Fleet, the Mock Director of Third Fleet, and also my Reserve Director under uh, OPNAV N9. Uh, he's got a wealth of operational experience. Uh, he was also the Deputy of Seventh Fleet, and he was also the final uh, NMOC uh, Commander. So you can certainly include him in your aperture of questions as you, uh, as you get after this. Uh, I could go on 20 minutes on topics every one of these gentlemen uh, hit, uh, but I'd rather turn it over to, to you for questions. So please, bring it on. Oh, right here, yeah, go ahead. I got lights in my eyes right behind your head. <laughs> Justin Katz, Inside Defense, uh, thank you for your time. I wanted to ask a question in terms of uh, naval integration, and I, I guess the most appropriate person would be Rear Admiral uh, Kilby, but I'd, I'd welcome all of your input. Uh, the Navy, at times, has integrated backwards. That is, they, they integrate, they see the problem, and then they solve the problem, F-35 and Thermion being the prominent example. Uh, to all of you, is there something your office is could be doing as the Navy's requirements officers uh, to prevent these kinds of issues, or do you think the issue is something other than requirements? So, uh, boss, let me just start out, and I think uh, certainly, I believe Ron has a piece to add to this about work he's doing, and, and maybe some others too. But um, I would say we are really focused on total ownership of the product now, and and it hasn't always been that way, but that includes training. That includes training and the user interfaces for our sailors to properly execute that mission. So um, you've got no more uh, fanatical group of folks than the, at the, those at the table. Specifically, I know of Satan and Ron and I having uh, experiences at training facilities where it takes 23 VAB actions to do something or whatever you call that on a joystick, a similar number of uh, right actions in the right order to great, great in effect. So uh, you are right. We haven't done a great job of that. Uh, I've waxed uh, poetic about that twice this week already, about things we haven't done that we need to fix, but I'm on it to fix it. And the RQB process, this more rigorous process I talked to you about, is, is designed to get at those things to make sure we deliver a whole program, or at least plan to do that, and not trade that capability away when it gets caught in the friction of delivering that piece. Um, this year in the POM process, we have a thing called wholeness balance reviews that's looking at the wholeness of those programs and identifying those things that are not whole and fixing them first. So that's just one example. Uh, I, I yield the floor to other folks and you, boss, if you want to add to that, a very good question. Go ahead, Ron. Yeah, so, uh we're like this in a lot of things. It's not just you know F-35 or others. I mean, we, we, we create these requirements years ago, and by the time they get through there, uh, I don't think we have, we don't bring the capabilities all together when we go through. I mean, so, and they go at different paces. I mean, the size of the F-35B, it's an international program with partners. That's a very complex integrated program. Uh, but I think, again, we, we, this goes to speed, the speed at which we produce capability, the agility with which we're able to do so. So part of that is, uh, creating stovepipe designs, things that, that, uh, that, that will only work with this system, right? And, uh, and that's, that's a party foul in this environment, okay? Going forward in the future, you also, so you have the commonality piece, we have to design with commonality. We have to kind of decide how we're gonna fight writ large. Uh, we haven't tasked me, for example, as a surface uh, requirements person to go solve the problem bigger than my own, okay? We are now looking at problems bigger than my own because uh, it's going to drive how we think about future capabilities. So there's kind of solve what we have right now to get better with what we have, as I said, and then program longer term. So creating systems that are more common, uh, virtualized system, things like that, that you know, bring their, that, that has its own challenges. Uh, but, but we think we have to uh, decide on how our systems can use those same things. If we're building a missile or a combat system or a radar, 
Uh, we got to make sure that it's interoperable with everything else. As uh, Satan called you know, interoperability, I'd, I'd go to, for, it's really interdependency of the future. I mean, that's where we have to go. So um, I, keep, I, I look at these as speed, agility, commonality will drive cost, um, but it also improves this, the, our capability itself. So uh, you're hitting on exactly, I think, the old way of doing business and why it didn't work. And we're telling you that with the speed of technology, we've got to go faster. We've got to eliminate the barriers to things that are slowing us down. You know, I'm part of the problem here. I worked in my joint job. I was a JSIDS officer that carried, you know, DOD 5000 around and held people accountable. And it frustrated me every day I was at work because, you know, for the advantage we made in getting joint, the clock ticked. And it's ticked way too long. And so we're trying to find that balance of going much faster, yet putting the rigor in to getting the requirements and the capabilities good enough to go forward and iterating much better. So creating systems that can be updated uh, on the fly, if you will. So get the requirement out there, prototype, move, get better, get better, get better. So that's the way we're trying to go. Um, you know, I, I hear it and I see it and we're trying to fix it. So to make sure that we actually have a plan to get that out there in some time frame and understanding what that is. Um, and also what we're going to do is make sure that we're not impacting the absorption rate. So if we're going to do a two-year software job or some kind of upgrades, hey, are we, are we positioned to actually have a, a, a process set up, the capability set up to actually support that two-year process? So we have a lot of work to be done, but we're starting to look at those things. Okay, so before I uh, pile on, did that get at your question? Good. Yes. Good job. All right. Uh, to complete a couple thoughts, um, and, as, and as cool as the Pentagon processes are, um, I won't bring you to your knees with them, uh, but an R3B is a Requirements Resources Review Board, and um, it's a process in some form or fashion that every program has to go through. So we're getting after a lot of these processes to, uh, to make them more relevant uh, with the demands of the capabilities we need to get out to the fleet. So when Jim talked about the R3B, uh, the process changes we're talking about is to have a very frank review of these programs that take years to field on, is it still relevant? Is it relevant in a cross-domain fight? Uh, can it be connected? Uh, these are becoming very fundamental questions that may translate to the survivability of that program. Or do we need to end this now and get on to something that is going to meet all those, all those criteria? Along those same lines, uh, we're working with our service partners and Department of Defense to have the conversations early about where is this program going to end up, uh, whose good idea is this, who wants it, and who's willing to transition it to their account. Often those conversations come at the end. You develop this great thing, uh, we don't have a platform for it, nor did we ask for it, and it cost a billion dollars. Um, that can be very unhinging for account, even as large as the Navy's uh, you know, total account. Um, so that we have made progress in all these areas, and then the, the, the final process change for those that have spent time in the Pentagon on the POM process, which is an ever-evolving process, and it should be. Uh, this year's big thing is we're getting these wholeness issues out of the way early. We're getting our readiness uh, funded early, so instead of cracking open the whole account at the end to try to make all this balance, which is very disruptive, uh, we're getting it done early, and then we're going to focus the majority of our effort on the investment accounts, uh, where we want the corporate board, which is the CNO, the VCNO, the four stars, the fleets, uh, their precious time is going to be focusing on the critical capability decisions uh, that we're going to go forward. So I hope that helps. All right, next. Thank you. Uh, Chris Kuhn, uh, Cape Henry, retired sailor. Uh, so, gentlemen, with the total fleet... I'm sorry, Chris, where'd you say you're from? Uh, Cape Henry Associates out of Norfolk. Yeah. Okay. So with the total fleet future vision and total integration, we already have a float forward staging bases that are doing work that's more than just Navy and Marines. Uh, we have PACOM coming on board and we're seeing a big shift that way. Do you see in the foreseeable future, one, more of the afloat forward staging bases playing a huge role, and also possibly adding our other two service components into that and into this panel? So I'll just say yes, yes, and yes, but I'll, uh, I'll turn it over to the panel here. Uh, I guess I can take a swig at yeah. 
Yeah, so the uh, afloat staging base concept uh, is not concept anymore, it's happening. Uh, so you're likely aware that uh, Fifth Fleet has now USS Polar forward, or ESB uh, commission for service forward appropriate to the tasks they're gonna have to do. Uh, there is, uh, I will say, appetite, and there's uh, space in the architecture for platforms like that. And I completely agree with the implications of your uh, statement up front that that is by rule a kind of multi-service or multi-mission type platform. There's deeper fight that's really uh, brokered out of N4 and elsewhere as far as future efforts on what those might be. But we have a piece of that for my, those who were with me yesterday. There was a lot buried in that sea basing redux big rock that I, which is, a, is a whole other subject because it gets to what other things are in the water in all different parts of the water space uh, that contribute to the naval campaign. But we are looking in real time at optimization of what we have now, the Navy we have now, and then we're looking at the Navy the nation needs for what are the numbers and types of those kinds of vessels. But to, to, just to go back to what, what I want to cherry pick, and you, I'll see, we'll see if we got it right if anybody else wants to add to it. Uh, as I covered yesterday and uh, Boss covered for me, uh, we're in a sweet spot in N95 on that because we have a touch to a lot of those customers. Marine, soft, or SOCOM are at large, we are NSW shop, uh, and then Navy itself in terms of logistics or other support and all parts of it. So we are excited about the prospect of that. We think there's space there, and frankly, we are not, we're not there. It's a big part. There's a whole section on the taxonomy of the fleet regarding expeditionary sea basing support that contains those type of platforms and we got to do some work to figure out what do we really need and where do we want to go with them. But they are going to be, in my view, for the subject kind of the, of the conference and the panel here, they're going to be kind of joint from birth. So we have project work in Navy SOCOM to talk about that, that the, the service that the CNO and uh, General Thomas have agreed to work on. So there's a lot of customers for that type of service. Is that close to where you're trying to go with that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Anybody you. else want to add? Uh, I'll just, uh, a couple clarifying points, not to stretch his answer, but to some of the terminology we've been using. If we, if we reference uh, to force architecture or the FSA, any of those tools, uh, that means it was an evaluated element of this 355 ship plan that hit the street last year. So the way we got to 355 is we did um, critical analysis of the different platforms we needed, how many of those platforms we needed, and then we added all those up, and it, it was, acceptable risk, uh, we actually ended up with a much larger number, um, which we call the frictionless plane number, and then we added real world fr friction into it and we got it back down to 355. So the float forward staging base is a key element uh, of that 355 uh, ship Navy. Uh, uh, Sydney Freeburg, Racing Defense. Let me hello, Sydney. Yes, hello. <laughs> uh, even without my crazy hair, I'm semi-recognizable. Uh, to, not now, uh, to pull in a thread here, you've talked a lot about cross-domain, about going beyond the traditional stovepipes, uh, and General Coffin particularly talked about you know, going beyond even the traditional domains the Navy operates into, of course, ashore. Uh, you know, to what extent are you working with the other services which have their own multi-domain concepts? To Air Force, multi-domain command and control, which is looking at the air tasking order in a very new way, which of course would involve any Marine uh, or Navy aviation. Uh, Army multi-domain battle, which has a, a land-based sea control component, much like the Marines concepts. Uh, to what degree are you folks in communication with, in consultation with, developing concepts even with uh, the other two service departments? Ron, you're looking like you want to answer that. <laughs> uh, great question. Um, I, I kind of see this as, um, you know, we, we have to solve our problems here first, but all those problems exist also in the joint community. So a little bit about the AFSB, similar. I mean, these are not unique to Navy. The, you know, the domains are not unique to Navy. And, um, and I will tell you that anything we're looking at going forward, uh, we're, we're engaging with industry a lot. Early. A lot of times industry is that linkage to those, uh, those things that are happening with the other services. So uh, we, we've been, I think, much better of late, and again, you all be the judge, many of industry here, um, but I know as we go and look at how we're engaging with industry, we can't go over there without them usually telling us what they're doing and who else is doing it, and I mean, even today, walking around, 
I could not go to any booth practically without someone saying, hey, we're doing this here, and we're doing it there, and how are they using it, how are we using it, where's the commonality, where can we find, and we've already done that with a lot of weapon systems. There's a lot more of that that already happens. We have a joint JSIDS process that has produced those types of uh, desires to get commonality across the services. I would argue that, that process is also too slow. Uh, so we, we are, I, I, I think the industry has really helped uh, in our personal example. Uh, we've got the, uh, the frigate uh, RFI or R RFP out there right now for detailed design and construction. Before we did that, we did a, a request for information out to the service. It was amazing to me uh, what came back from that just on, on, on what industry had learned from there. I'm crossing over into the Navy only side, but, uh, but they came over and, you know, hey, these are the things that are driving us nuts about your requirement. If they all said it drive us nuts, then we got to go reconsider that. Uh, similarly, in the joint environment, when we go and they say, hey, you've already solved this problem. Um, we've already done this. There's a lot of those discussions. I mean, uh, there's not a lot of other services that have ships, so less for me, but I'd defer to Satan on this one. Yeah, I think, well, at the, at the bigger picture, there's warfighter talks within, uh, yeah. typically around my N35, um, but where the Navy will talk to the Army or the Navy will talk to the Air Force or the Navy will talk to the Air Force, and there's a drumbeat that sets that up. Between N98 and my counterparts in the Air Force, we do have uh, a good dialogue and open discourse in terms of, okay, compare notes, this is what we're working on, these are the concepts that we're de developing, here's some of the technology that we're thinking about, and we compare notes. And then there is also shared costing in some of our weapons, not to be any, any specific, but where we are both programming two weapons that we put on strike fighters or helicopters, uh, you name it. So, and then out in the fleet and at the tactical level, uh, the warfighting development centers are working with their counterparts and the other services, specifically the Navy and the, and, the, and the Air Force at Nellis, and where we're doing fourth to fifth generation, I think the F-35 was mentioned earlier, those TTPs are being written uh, now between the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marine Corps uh, in terms of how we're going to employ this airplane with other legacy type of systems, fourth generation or earlier. Um, and they compare notes at the tactical level. These young, trained, disciplined, whatever type model series you're flying are working with their counterparts in the Air, Air Force, I will say, on a routine basis. Can I just add, yeah, just to use that to exploit it, for us, for ours particularly, and we've talked about this a little bit this week in the conference. I know we have a number of the attaches and others here. I would extend that to partners and allies. Uh, in a lane that was not focused for this week, but our MCM work and many of the of the areas that I sponsor, we're really looking hard weeks and months ahead to make sure same thing in terms of a commonality on operational approach and then all the way back to uh, fiscal, technical, and operational integration or interdependence or interoperability, whatever degree of I we can get to. Uh, and we think there's a lot of blessing there. Uh, and if you're reading, as you should, the uh, national strategy and kind of our approach, it's not disengaging from partners and allies. If you bought my thesis, we're going to need ever more intimate contact because we're going to have to be out there ready to go and ready to transition across the range of military operations. So we, we need a lot of help joint force, I think it is a move to interdependence, good interdependence, not just for the sake of jointness, which a lot of us uh, probably grew up in in years past. So there's, there's a lot of stuff uh, uh, that will bless us in that space. Thanks. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd add is uh, in addition to uh, warfighter talks, we do war games together. Today I took a brief uh, on a joint war game, and I'll leave it at that at a, at, at a much higher classification level. But we look at performance of Navy weapon systems with other services all the time. And I know just from my recent experience on Strike Group 1, we are operating with our joint forces and working on TTP and tactics and performance together. So there's a lot of work happening. I think we need to keep the pressure on to do that. Certainly. The interdependency is something we're all focused on and getting after, and I and I and I think we has, have work to do, to be honest with you. But we're we're about doing it. Yeah, I would just offer, uh, having recently served at a combatant command, that uh, our combatant commanders uh, do look at fighting the wars and, and how they're going to do that across service. And when they do see a capability gap, they are they are not shy to submit a submit an nipple to the joint staff to get to get fixed, and then. Uh, the services are untapped to provide the best solution. So I'll tell you, you know, the, uh, 
there's, there's, a, there's a couple of characterizations of a, a staunch fiscal environment. Um, there is just the fact of either not getting what you want or not getting it with the authorities you want, code for a continuing resolution. Um, but then there's a staunch fiscal environment in an, in an environment where the operations continue to increase. Um, and I will tell you, we've stayed amazingly connected with our counter services uh, through this tough fiscal environment um, with the growing um, you know, major power competition. And uh, just like we have migrated to our cross-domain solutions to help be more lethal uh, or essentially fight with the lethality of a larger force, we've leveraged that across the services doing the same thing. I will tell you, it's always been healthy out in the fleet uh, under the uh, combatant commanders where we're forced together. Um, but we've seen that bleed back into the joint staff and, uh, and the warfighter talks that, that we sustain in background as we all, you know, kind of get into our bastion mode of protecting our own readiness. Time for one more. Gentlemen, thank you. I'm Rick Caporale, Navigator USS Champion. Um, with LCS having continued to fail to take over the surface capability of the MCM warfare area and the minesweepers downstream struggling financially because of it, um, <clears throat> I would argue that if we went to war tonight or tomorrow, we would be at a disadvantage against our enemy in any effective offensive or de defensive enemy MCM campaign. So that being said, what investments into the future health of our continuing surface MCM capability are we making so that while we continue to struggle to transition, we maintain this capability as best we can? That's somewhere in the middle of the table there. Yes. <laughs> right there. Uh. <laughs> Thank so, you. So, long subject. And I've, I've yeah. talked to the Mine Warfare Association friends uh, we try next year to get a separate panel, and I, we appreciate your interest in this area. We covered this at a at other conference. We have had high contact, including at service level with the uh, Admiral Murs and others' help at Naval Board for Navy, Marine, and others to look at this. Can't answer it in two minutes uh, other than give you some assurance, and I still will ask, as we did yesterday, I think we got a similar question for Ron to uh, give the LCS version. Uh, but we have a path ahead. We have a plan for our mine warfare capability. It's been uh, uh, looked at in detail by the CNO and Commandant uh, and the right senior leadership. Uh, it is, as you say, a balancing act for emerging capability, what we have to fight tonight capability and how to husband or apportion that to the right theaters and the right places to do the best we can. Uh, and then continue to work on with something of an entrepreneurial spirit, as I encourage CNO to do, that we're, we're not there yet, but we're at the cusp of a lot of great improvements across domains that are going to be applied because this area screams for a multi-domain or cross-domain solutions that are going to, and all of us at this table, have pieces and parts of the MCM portfolio. As I covered yesterday, by law, I'm supposed to put a look on it, and the boss helps us with that, but everybody's got pieces and parts. We offer it, frankly, as an opportunity to further this sense of cross-domain cross, cross domain work. So we're going to get there. We have adjusting timelines for the mission packages, their application to LCS. CNO has made loud and clear, and I've told people when we brief this elsewhere, it's not, and I still ask Ron to chip in here as you did yesterday, but it's not LCS equals MCM. He said put a slash through that, that that's one way to apply a mission package for uh, mine countermeasures. We've got a lot of other ways to do it, and we're going to continue to mature them. And that's, that's the best I can do in yeah, 30 so seconds. Before I turn it over to Ron, I, I will tell you, um, this is an area we, we, we've kind of migrated to this uh, family of systems, and it just helps leadership get their head around uh, mission areas that have a lot of moving parts. Uh, it turns out <clears throat> most of our mission areas are either there or heading in that direction. Uh, one of the things you need to you know, succeed in mine warfare is enduring leadership alignment behind it, and I think we have that now. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of investments. I'm not going to get into specific capabilities, uh, but as an away game Navy, uh, we frankly just get less interested in things that are kind of bastion Navy things. I mean, we got to carry that thing out there, and we got to set up shop. You got to defend it. You got to protect it. 
you know, just by nature of your question, I, I suspect you understand all the complexities that go into uh, mine warfare. Uh, that being said, um, there are a few more affordable ways for a less capable Navy to bring a larger Navy to its knees uh, than mine warfare. And, or keeping it at bay or just keeping it from doing the maneuvers it wants to do. So it, it does have that leadership. It is gaining the investments. Uh, and I think you're going to see some rapid improvement on this. And LCS is just a piece of it. So I'll pass it over to Ron. Yeah, so I own LCS. Uh, mission packages are over on his side, but we work together to produce the capability. And so uh, I ch understand your probably frustration of the hard work you have to do on Champion. Uh, those are ships have, have given their all in their service so far, and, and we need to squeeze a little bit more out of them before these come on together. We understand we have some technical background. We're not going to go into that right now, but we are where we are. Uh, I think we got a good plan going forward, and you'll see some of that coming out in the next year, uh, and I hope you'll be excited about it. For LCS, on the LCS side of it, uh, there have been some huge improvements in LCS made uh, over the past uh, year or so since I've been in the job. None associated to me. I put the credit on the waterfront and uh, you know, those sailors uh, manning those ships, uh, the, the, what we're learning on Coronado's deployment right now out there in the Western Pacific, she had, she had a phenomenal deployment. Uh, we have taken a lot of lessons learned from the early things. You know, we're, we, we do have some things we still have to get after, uh, but you know, right now we have uh, 11 of those ships out there. We've got, they're coming on quick. They're now starting to really ratchet in. Uh, through the, if the NDAA right now authorizes 31 of those right now. Uh, so these are gonna be out there and they're gonna be good, capable ships. Uh, we just need to continue to keep our eye on that ball. Uh, keep doing the best you can out there. Uh, we know it's an incredibly important mission and why we've kept those ships like yours around so long. Who out here has been on an LCS? Anybody? Yeah, it's hard not to walk around those ships and just not admire the potential of what we can do with these. So we're, we're in full support of the, the LCS and we have, uh, we have key uh, work areas that, that, that we need that that, uh, that capability. So I think Jim wants to make one final comment, yeah, then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, the final comment is uh, Admiral Murs was the Global Mine Warfare Commander when he was the commander of NMOC. That uh, function transitioned to SMITIC when we stood it up. John Wade is now the Global Mine Warfare Commander for SMITIC. So three guys in the room who were charged with the operational employment of that mission area and advocating for that mission area. And there's a couple things that uh, just make, make you feel like you're not alone because I've been on many MCMs and I got that feeling from the crew and talking to the crew. Uh, there is a Mine Warfare, uh, My WIP, Mine Warfare Improvement Process program that goes on every year uh, that I, is led by Admiral Wade and his staff, uh, by Admiral Murs and me in my time, where we look at the state of Mine Warfare. From that effort is, is IPPLs are produced and passed up the chain, but they directly link back into 96 and 95. Uh, they also produce a state of the mine warfare uh, for, this, for Navy leadership, which is unvarnished in its uh, advocacy for the mission area and, and veracity which, which it calls out the condition of ships. And that has transitioned into the mine warfare governance process and advocating for extension of the MCM service life so we can shepherd that mission area. But in many exercises, SMITIC now uh, looks at things that were advocated by Admiral or General Kaufman where we took an expeditionary MCM company on Coronado in 2016 during RIMPAC and did mine warfare uh, with an MCM. So uh, we've got focus on this. We don't have the missionary where we need to be, but we're working it hard, as Admiral Merce said. Okay. Well, on behalf of SNA, uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, round of applause for the panel here. A lot of enthusiasm. Thanks. All right, thanks for being such a great audience as well, and to the panel, just terrific. Really fascinating, and I hope we can do this every year.